Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Show Me Tarantulas, the ecology of Aphona Poma Hensai in Missouri Glades with Becky Hansis O'Neill. My name is Haley Howard and I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, I will read those out to Becky. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with any resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on Becky. Becky Hansis O'Neill is a PhD student in the biology department at University of Missouri, St. Louis. She received her BS in psychology and MS in biological sciences from Idaho State University. She has conducted research on topics such as behavioral pharmacology, developmental neurobiology, parasite host interactions, and stable isotope analysis. In her spare time, she enjoys nature photography and bird watching. Her photography has been featured in various publications, websites, signage, and social media for organizations such as the Smithsonian Insider, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Grand Teton National Park, and the Nature Conservancy. We are excited to have Becky here today to share her expertise with us. And now I'll hand it over to Becky. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm very happy to talk to everyone about my tarantula work today. Um, and I'm hoping that you'll enjoy it and learn some things. And I'm always happy to share about what we're up to when we're out serving for tarantulas. So a little bit of history about how this project got started. So you may have noticed in my bio that my research has been quite broad um, with a background in psychology. My interest is in animal behavior. And in the lab, I actually do study tarantula behavior, specifically the physiology of their fight or flight responses. And I was hoping to be able to collect some adult tarantulas for research. So I contacted the Missouri Department of Conservation and um, the Forest Service here in Missouri. And they said, well, we don't really know how many there are. So we don't feel comfortable with anyone collecting them. And I was so early in my research that I asked, well, could I go count them? And we've been doing that. This is our second season. So we've been doing that for two years now. And it's been generating some really interesting conservation related questions as well as ecological um, questions and just some interesting data as well. So there's three main parts of the project. So we do population surveys. We have two sites here in Missouri. Part of our permit um, rules basically to keep our permit is that we can't say exactly where the sites are. So I'll just be saying site one and site two. Uh, we also want to do some genetics. We wanna know how healthy these populations are in terms of inbreeding and their genetic health. And we've been learning a lot about their natural history here in Missouri. So when they do what kinds of different things. So I'll go over each of these today as well as some takeaways and a whole lot of the natural history and some cool things that we've seen while we've been surveying tarantulas. So first, what is a tarantula? So there are two big branches in spider evolution. There's your true spiders, which are gonna be your orb weavers, your jumping spiders, your wolf spiders, versus your more basal spiders. So when we say basal, we think they just look a little bit more like the common ancestor of all spiders. And that's gonna be your tarantulas, trapdoor spiders, and a few others. The way I tell tarantulas apart from things like really big wolf spiders is I look for how hairy they are. Tarantulas are much hairier. I look at the shape of their feet. The tarantulas have cute little round toes with those little toe pads that you can see in this picture. And wolf spiders tend to have really pointy tips of their, their feet. Um, and then also size. Tarantulas are just gonna be really beefy. They're like the SUV of the spider world and big wolf spiders are gonna be more like a Lamborghini. So that's what I look for when I'm trying to figure out is this spider I'm seeing, is it a tarantula? So a few things about tarantula conservation really broadly. So there's about 1200 species of tarantula in the world. Um, those species names get revised pretty frequently. 
uh, a lot of tarantulas are very difficult to tell apart. So that number is flexible. There's only 46 of them listed on the IUCN Red List. And if you throw IUCN Red List into Google, you'll find that that's a uh, NGO, a non-governmental organization that maintains listings for species throughout the world of plants and animals. And if they're endangered, threatened, anything like that. So there's 46 tarantulas on there and most of them don't have a rating. It just says not enough data to make a determination. So there's really a big knowledge gap for tarantulas worldwide in terms of conservation needs. About half the species that we find in the world can also be found in the pet trade. So there is some demand to get tarantulas in. And I'll talk more about captive breeding programs and sustainability in the pet trade, but just keep that in mind that there is uh, value, especially for rare species and things in the pet trade. So a phone palmahensi, they are a uh, pretty widespread throughout the United States. I'd say if you had a center point, and I'll show you a map in a little bit, it, it would be Texas. Um, they're pretty long lived. Anything in the Sophona palma genus uh, typically lives a long time. Um, our data on this is actually not as good as I would like it to be. There are some studies of zoological records, as well as um, individual reports of tarantula researchers who are also keepers, and uh, lots of anecdotal reports from breeders and keepers for these uh, ages. But in terms of official data that's been published in a scientific journal, there's only a handful of uh, good age ranges. So these are estimates. So males typically living between seven and 10 years, females 20 plus, um, they're both gonna be maturing in that seven to 10 year range or a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, just depends. Um, like I said, they have a pretty wide distribution. Here in Missouri, we're at the one of the most northern stretches of their range. Um, there's some reports of seeing them around Denver, so that I think they're a little bit more north than us, but we're really at the edge. Afona pelma in general are desirable tarantulas. They're pretty common in the, the pet hobby. If you were to go ask a knowledgeable tarantula person, what's what should I start with? They would probably recommend a spider or tarantula in this genus. Usually if you're looking, you can find them cheaper than what I have listed here, 30, 40 bucks. But if you're looking online, I've seen them between 60 and 150 for like a big female, that's pretty rare. But if you're seeing an adult Aphonopelma because they have these really long maturation times, it takes them a while to get big. If you're seeing a larger juvenile or an adult for sale, there's a there's a higher chance that that was a wild caught individual because economically having a breeder raise a baby tarantula, which we call a sling, for 10 years before selling it or it bouncing around between owners is, is a little less likely. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. There are people that do captive breeding programs for Phonopelma, but um, if you're seeing a big one at a, a tarantula, like a pet shop or a uh, reptile show, you should probably be asking where that individual came from. So here's where they live. This is just from iNaturalist. If you haven't used iNaturalist, I recommend checking it out. It's a great citizen science platform for reporting uh, plant and animal sightings. And you can see we get lots of high intensity red color down in Texas. Uh, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, and you can see some also in Oklahoma and then up in Colorado as well. And then in Missouri, it starts to get patchier and patchier up until you get to St. Louis. And then brand new this year, if you can see this little square just to the right of St. Louis under the eye in Indianapolis, someone has actually reported a tarantula across the Mississippi. And that's uh, that's new. So I've been I'm trying to get a hold of this person. Um, we also have a couple sightings north of the Missouri. And those rivers were thought to be boundaries for their ranges here in the Midwest. So um, just on my own time, I'm trying to investigate those uh, and see where they found them. Are there likely to be more of that kind of thing? So this is where we find um, a hensei. So through our research, we have figured out um, when they do things, at least here in Missouri, there's going to be some variation depending on if you're further south versus further north and that kind of thing. We start to see them come out in May. 
and we see activity go up through June. And then the actual number of tarantulas that we see uh, dips in the hottest parts of the summer, and then it comes back up for mating season. And there's a couple things that we see here that were really exciting for me because I hadn't seen them in the wild before. So we start seeing egg sacs in the middle of July, and then we start to see those egg sacs hatching and babies uh, dispersing in August. That's also when we start seeing molts from the adults, and we can actually collect the molts for analysis later. We tend to see, start to see um, in late October activity decreasing. If you are seeing tarantulas in more southerly parts of Missouri, it might be even a little bit longer. But for us, um, that's where we start to see them tapering off. So where do they live? Well, they live in burrows under the ground. Um, they can also make what's called a scrape burrow, which doesn't go all the way underground. It's just kind of like a little ditch that they carve out. Uh, when we look for tarantulas, we are able to tease them out of their burrow with something soft, like a little piece of grass. Um, and most of the time, we can get them to come out. However, sometimes uh, we can't, and we don't pour water down there. We don't dig them up. We don't do anything like that. We don't want to destroy the habitat. So we use the sewer camera that you would use for sewer inspections to look at burrows. And most of the time, it looks like this. Say, okay, there's not really anything in here. But when you get a tarantula, <laughs> they usually make themselves known, or if they're really far back there, sometimes you see a little toe. So the bigger adults tend to be in these deeper burrows. And I think this is very good defensively. If any other animals come in and try to bother them, they're met with the fangs, the business end of the spider. So this is often what we see when we're photographing them. Now, for this genus, I think it's likely that they hang around in their burrow or near their burrow, and as unsuspecting prey items walk by, they, they grab them. However, I've seen a little bit of behavior this year that makes me think maybe they're a little more active at night and in the early season after they're coming out of brew mating for the, for the season, that they might actually be moving around a little bit more. For example, we found an individual sitting outside their burrow actually eating a prey item I think that was back in May. And I kept checking that spot and would occasionally find little prey items. So I think they might be a little more active than I'm giving them credit for. Um, there is a study, it was about 20 years ago in Missouri where a student put uh, transmitters on them, but it was males in the mating season. And as we, we go on, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but they do a lot more moving around. So it'd be really interesting uh, for me to see if are big females that have established burrows if they're hanging out and where they like to go. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about in terms of conservation is really closely tied to the mating system in tarantulas. And tarantula and spider sex in general is a very cool topic. They The way they do it is a little bit strange. So in tarantulas, the males make what's called a sperm web. They deposit sperm onto the web and they use special organs at the end of their pedipalps which they look like legs, but they're not, but they're those front little appendages that look like arms. Um, and they suck up the sperm into these special organs, and then they use those to actually inseminate the female. So to get fresh sperm, they have to keep making these sperm webs. They also develop um, another body part called a tibial hook, and they use those, that's in the center picture here, to actually hold back the fangs of the female tarantula while they do the inseminating. So all these specialized body parts only show up after the, the male tarantula sexually matures, and that's going to be his last molt of his life. So he's going to perish and he's going to die at the end of the mating season once he's mature. So the males have the shelf life and the females, they have much longer lifespan and can keep mating and keep breeding. So in a case like this, when the males molt, or I guess for this genus, let me back up. When the males molt, their colors change a little bit. On the far left here, you can see they get this really coppery cephalothorax, these beautiful red hairs on their abdomen, and these jet black legs. So it's very easy to spot a mature male because they have uh, just these spectacular colors. And they're going to go for a walkabout. So they're going to go look for females. Sometimes the females will leave a little bit of webbing if they're receptive outside their burrows, and the males can smell that. Once they meet, the male will do some tapping on the ground. And if the female is receptive, sometimes she'll tap back. 
the males can do a little gauging, like, is this a good idea? Can I mate with her without getting eaten? Um, and then if possible, the male will try to get away. And I would say, I'm not a tarantula breeder, but watching them in the wild in a couple pairings that I've seen, as well as just reading and research, the males do try to get away. They're not trying to sacrifice themselves. Uh, that's what the hooks are about. And I think when the females are receptive, the males have a reasonable chance of doing that. Um, so, yeah. So the males have a lot of danger that they have to deal with, with mating from females and then from predators while they're out walking around. So next life stage that we see, babies. So the females will take care of their egg sacs. Once the babies hatch, they go through a couple molts very quickly as they grow. And then when they're ready, they start dispersing. So this egg sac that you see here was one we found out in the wild. Um, and you can see some of the babies look a little hairier than the others. Uh, so you can see some of them are actually further along in their molting than their siblings. So once they hit this stage, they hang out with their mother for a little while, and then they start to disperse and they start to, to leave uh, the main burrow, at which point they're very, very vulnerable to other predators. And there's quite a few predators that can uh, attack tarantulas in our glade habitats here in Missouri. So at one of our sites, we have confirmed sightings of tarantula hawks. So this big picture with the wasp and the tarantula, that's actually from here in Missouri. So tarantula hawks are parasitoid wasps. So they don't actually, the adults don't eat the tarantulas. The adults like nectar, they're pollinators. I've got a picture from a tarantula hawk from New Mexico down there. She's drinking out of a milkweed. The reason they need tarantulas is for reproduction. So the female tarantula hawk will sting the tarantula. The venom paralyzes the tarantula, doesn't kill it necessarily. She's gonna drag it underground and then she's gonna lay eggs. Once those eggs hatch into wasp larvae, they're gonna eat the tarantula. So it's a way of like keeping a pretty large food source for a wasp larva fresh uh, to be eaten. So it's a pretty gruesome way to go. Um, I've heard of people trying to save tarantulas in this scenario, but it's just, once they're paralyzed, it's kind of a, an uphill battle. So we do have tarantula hawks here in Missouri. Another predator that is very, very common in pretty much all habitats are gonna be wolf spiders and even funnel web spiders as well. In this case, we measured a tarantula and this is the only case I've seen this happen while we've been surveying. Uh, we let it go. We went and had some lunch, came back and we found that a wolf spider had, had gotten a hold of this tarantula. So I took the, the body so we could um, do genetic analysis. Unfortunately, the tarantula was dead, but it goes to show you that even though this wolf spider pound for pound is lighter than the tarantula you see in this picture, it was able to take it down. So wolf spiders are gonna be um, active hunters. They're running around, they have really good vision. They're pretty smart as far as spiders go. So I wasn't actually super surprised that this wolf spider was able to take down this juvenile tarantula. And there are lots and lots of these wolf spiders. So if you're a baby tarantula, if you're a sling and you're just leaving the burrow, there's a really good chance something's gonna eat you. And we see that tarantulas have evolved to mitigate this risk. So females can have anywhere from a couple hundred eggs up to about a thousand in this species. So they're trying to win a numbers game. Like, it's kind of like baby sea turtles, like, please, somebody make it to maturity. So there's lots of ways that young tarantulas can die. So where do they live in Missouri? You've heard me mention glades a few times. So they like glade habitats. Glades tend to be hilly grasslands with very specific geology. Some of them have volcanic rocks, um, often surrounded by forest or have forest and shrubs in places where water runs down glades and hills. Um, they tend to be very sunny and they host species that you might expect to actually find in a desert. So we find yucca plants, we'll find prickly pears, uh, scorpions, collared lizards, things like that will live in glades. So a couple of critters that we've found, we see lots and lots of reptiles. Uh, so snakes, lizards, turtles, that kind of thing. Um, so we definitely have to follow some safety protocols. Uh, this copperhead is the only venomous snake I found on our sites, but uh, definitely treated it with some respect. We also get lots of small mammals on glades. This was another uh, critter 
that we found little, I'm not sure if she's a, a deer mouse. She's a little bit big, so maybe even a wood rat, but she was nursing pups. Um, she didn't run away. We were able to just snap a quick picture and, and let her continue with her pups, but there's uh, lots of rodents that live on glades. We see evidence of that everywhere. We also get surprisingly lots of amphibians. So a lot of toads, a lot of salamanders, um, also living on glades. And then lots and lots of other arthropods. So here we've got a scorpion, she's carrying her babies on her back. So it's really fun to get to see them go through their life cycles as well as the tarantulas. And then there's lots of unique plants that are on the glade. Um, I already mentioned a couple, the yucca and the prickly pear cactus. Um, Leather flowers, another one that we've seen, and then uh, green milkweed, which likes really rocky soils. It's the milkweed people don't think about as often. We also see in glades. And this one I thought was pretty cool that we found. It's covered in weevils and ants. So we get really unique species that live in these glade habitats here in Missouri. So where do we find glades? So there's a few that are north of the Missouri River, but you're going to see most of them in the south. So it's this sort of pink stuff you see on the map here. If we zoom in to the southern part of the state, you can see these glades a little bit better. So while looking at this, I want to think about like what you notice about patterns here with our glades. One of the big things that jumps out to me is that we have lots of glades that are isolated. So if you were a tarantula up here near um, Mansfield, could you actually mate with the tarantulas in the glade nearest to you? Versus if you get down um, in more southerly rural areas, we actually do have big chunks of glade that are connected. So how are tarantulas doing that are in these big glade complexes versus in these little tiny glades that aren't really very well connected? So why are glades special? Why do we have these desert species here? So this is a little bit hand wavy. This is my hypothesis. I am not a paleoclimate biologist, uh, paleontologist. But based on what I've been reading in the literature, I think something like this is approximately what's happened and why we have these desert species here. So around 9,000 years ago, and we're starting to see end of the Pleistocene, um, we get a brief period in the Midwest that's a little bit warmer and a little bit drier. So this area of cold actually shifts up to higher latitudes. And that has gives our southern species in the United States, it gave them more space to move up. So the most northern part of their ranges also shifted. So around 5,000 years ago, the climate started to get colder and wetter again. So that has created glade islands basically. So instead of a big continuous piece of habitat, we have glade complexes, glade islands. So as um, time continues, keep going forward, we see changes in fire regimes. We have people moving in, settling, they're converting glade to farmland, or they're fighting wildfire. So we start seeing uh, actually woody plants growing on glades that normally would be burned on a regular basis. And now our glades look something like this, where we have these really patchy habitats with our desert species sort of stuck on these islands. So it means these habitats are really special and really fragile for the species that live there. So this might sound familiar if you're familiar with glades in Missouri. So collared lizards, another desert adapted species, has faced some of these really similar issues with habitat fragmentation and glades becoming these little islands. So when researchers started looking at collared lizards, they figured out that they had very low genetic diversity because they were stuck on these little islands and getting inbred. And that as glade quality deteriorated, more trees and shrubs were growing in glades, that was making the glades cooler on average. And our tarantulas, our collared lizards, our ectothermic animals, they need to get their heat from the environment around them. So glades that are too cool are unsuitable for these sorts of animals. So they were able to start working on projects that restored glades to a better state, getting rid of those woody shrubs, connecting them to make sure lizards could get from glade to glade. Um, 
as well as reintroducing lizards to certain areas to help with genetic diversity. So our tarantulas might follow, end up following a very similar trajectory. We're at this point, it, the data is still pretty new and we're trying to figure that out. So what do we do for tarantula surveys? So we systematically sample those two sites I was telling you about. And by systematically, I just mean we try to make it the same every time. When we find a tarantula, we collect some information about their burrow, the temperature, the humidity, and how deep it is. We get the location so we can come back and look at uh, maps and habitat later when we're done. We also measure the body length and the head width of the tarantulas, and we do our best to sex them. Um, on younger animals, that can be really, really hard, and even on adult animals, sometimes it's difficult. We also give them a tag that has a unique number and color. They molt those off every year, but that helps us if we visit a site a couple times within the same year that we know, okay, we already did you this year, so we're not going to measure you again. We're just going to say hello and, and carry on. So it helps us estimate uh, which tarantulas we've already found before at least within the same year. I have had a couple tags that have lasted um, through the winter, but that's more uncommon and they're gonna molt later. We've also had cases where we'll visit a burrow, we'll find a molt outside the edge of the burrow and it has last year's tag and a very similar sized tarantula that looks beautiful like it just molted. So we make a reasonable assumption that that's probably the same spider. So our results. So for our site one, we get a little less than one tarantula per acre. And in site two, it's not even that. We're talking more like 0.4 tarantulas per acre. So maybe one every two approximately. We also have some good size distribution data. I'm showing you the 2022 data because we're working on the 2023 data. And you can see that we have a big skew for adult tarantulas. In our, in our data set. So if we look at that, you can see that anything with a body length of above three centimeters, it, it, you're starting to get into sizes where they could be reproducing and sexually mature. Anything below that is too young. And then there's a little bit of a no man's land. So I've seen mature males that were very, very small spiders. So this is interesting. It could be that young spiders choose slightly different habitats than older spiders, so we're less likely to find them. So that's one thing that could be going on. Second, we've already talked about how dangerous it is to be a baby tarantula on a glade. It could be that so many of them get eaten by other predators that those numbers are just always going to be very, very low. So this starts to paint a picture on what population dynamics might be in these glades? How quickly do these populations of tarantulas grow and shrink? So if you think about it, it takes seven to 10 years to get to that reproductive size. On, a, on average, there's going to be differences. That means that it's going to take us a while to know if there's a problem. So if we have a year where none of the baby spiders make it, um, it's going to take some time to see that in the reproductive population, the number of adults, because they have a long time to mature. So the fact that many of the babies probably die, and it takes seven to 10 years for them to sexually mature, you have the potential for a very slow growing population. Uh, one of the things that influences that is how many adult reproductive tarantulas do you have? This is a numbers game that we need to win. So let's talk about that. So in ecology, there's something called the Ali effect. And it basically says if a population is too small, there just aren't enough reproductive opportunities um, for that population to grow in any meaningful way. And that's not normally how we think of it, right? We think, oh, I have a population of three rabbits. And next year, I'm going to have 10 rabbits. You will have more than that, actually. But we tend to think of it as a, a steady increase. And for some animals, based on just their life histories, that's not the case. The Ali effect is considerably more complicated than that and covers more scenarios, but this low population density is the one I want us to foc focus on. So 
In this example, I have a grid with lots of different animals on it. I have green male spiders, pink female spiders. I have some predators interspersed. And let's pretend this is maybe a five or a 10 acre section. When it, mating season happens, the males don't have to go very far to find a female. Maybe one square over, maybe two. Um, there's also lots of them. So even if a tarantula hawk gets one of those males, there's more males that can take his place. Uh, for females, if um, you know, if you like keeping tarantulas or if you ever tried to breed them, you know that multiple mating attempts are more likely to be successful. So not only is it important that these males live, it's pretty important that the females get to mate multiple times in order to have success and make an egg sac the following season. Because remember, this is happening in the fall. Female's going to make her egg sac next August, almost a year later. So they they have to store the sperm. It needs to be good quality. So multiple mating, good. Lots of males, good. So what happens if our population density is really, really low? Well, the males, you can see now they have to move two or three squares to find a female. And in this case, I only have four males and two females. So if the males get um, taken out by a predator, tarantula hawk, bird, whatever, lizard, um, there's fewer males to mate with the remaining females. And this female that's up in the upper left corner might never see a male in the season, in that mating season. So our populations can get stuck where they can't really grow because the males are taking these big risks because they have to go further to find females. There's fewer males. So they're more likely to get caught by a predator. If you think about, um, big groups of wildebeest crossing rivers in Africa and Nile crocodiles getting a couple of them, they're more likely to do better if they're in big groups, like the individual probability you're gonna get eaten goes down. So we wanna see that with our males here, but in a low density population, you don't see that. And then lastly, the females are gonna get less matings overall than they would in a big healthy population. So all this leads to fewer egg sacs the following year. So what is a big population of a phonopelma? Hensai. There's this big assumption from scientists that because the species is so common in the southern parts of its range and even up in Colorado, that they're fine. And it was actually very difficult for me to find a few people that mentioned population density. So here is what I found. So in Texas, um, and this paper is from 2016. There's a lab, the lab's actually in Idaho, uh, but they revised the whole Ophonopelma genus, did a bunch of really great phylogenetic work. And they just happened to report for Hensai that they found 40 individuals in one Fort Worth backyard, like a residential backyard. So let's presume this is a really rich neighborhood and this is a huge yard, that it's an acre. That's 40 individuals per acre compared to one per acre at our sites. I was also lucky enough to get to speak with some tarantula researchers that do work in short grass prairie in Colorado. So up more north, kind of where we are. And one of them said, well, my study site is an acre and I have 70 burrows on that acre. So what we can see is the two sites that I'm studying in Missouri have really, really low populations. So they're at risk for that Ali effect and not uh, being able to grow properly. So in addition to assessing the numbers of the population, like I just talked about, we also want to know about genetic health. We have these little populations that are in islands. Are they getting inbred? If we get enough inbreeding, you can sometimes see something called inbreeding depression, where you're starting to get fewer and fewer offspring that are healthy and can even make it to adulthood. So we have two methods um, to assess genetic health that we're working on right now. One is called ISSR and the other is just I'm just looking at the mitochondrial genome. And I like using two methods because if you're a newbie at population genetics like I am, or just even really good at it, if you're using two very different methods and they're giving you similar results, you can have more faith and confidence in those results. So let's talk a little bit about ISSR. This has been used in tarantulas before. The data you're looking at right now is from a study on two populations of brachypelma, so your, your fire legs. Um, we have population A and population B. And the pattern you're seeing here is actually DNA that's been run across uh, something called an agarose gel. And the DNA will get 
stuck isn't quite the right word, but it will travel along the gel. We use a current to pull the DNA through because DNA has a charge. Um, and big chunks travel slower than really little chunks. So if you see bands at the lower part of this image, they're shorter, they've traveled farther. So basically what we do is we look at the whole genome of the tarantula and we look at what popular science articles call junk DNA. And that's a that could be a whole other talk. But we basically look for this DNA that's not coding for genes or anything like that. And we're looking for repeats of the same bits of genetic code. So we take these repeats, we use chemical reaction to amplify them. So we get for short little repeats, we get little pieces of DNA. And for long repeats, we get really big ones. And we run that through the gel. And that produces a different pattern. And you can see the pattern in A is relatively consistent. So almost all of them have that really dark band in the middle. There's one that doesn't. Uh, a good chunk of them have those bands at the top. If we look at population B, they don't have big bands at the top. They do have some of the middle bands. They do have some of the lower bands. But again, on average, their, their uh, pattern looks different. So once you can find these regions where you get really nice looking bands of DNA, you can make a matrix. And you can say, yes, this tarantula has this band, or no, it doesn't. Um, and you can start to place them in different populations just by looking at those patterns. And you can say, yep, you came from population A, you came from population B. We can also calculate how similar the populations are. And that's what I'm interested in doing with our phonopelma is, do you all look the same? Do you look really different? What I'm hoping is from our two sites is that they'll look similar because that means they're probably swapping genes if they look more similar. If they look really, really different, that means, uh-oh, these, this habitat fragmentation is similar to the collared li lizards where they're evolving separately and their genetics are starting to look really, really different. So that is ISSR in a nutshell. Um, the same methods we use for brachypelma aren't carrying over as nicely to phonopelma as I would like, but we're still gonna keep working on it. Luckily, it's, it's not a super cost intensive method. The next one, mitochondrial DNA, um, this one is a little bit different. If I had all the money in the world, I would actually be looking at nuclear DNA. So in each cell in your body, you have two genomes, one in your mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, and one in the nucleus of your cell. So mitochondrial DNA tends to change a little bit slower over evolutionary time. Um, it's inherited through mother's uh, in this case, I liked it because it's a lot smaller than the nuclear genome. And this really nice paper came out in 2020 where they actually label all the different genes on the tarantula mitochondrial genome. And they also looked at those genes and said, okay, we think this one is getting more changes more rapidly. So you can see the light blue gene on the far right is far higher in terms of uh, evolution rate. That's maybe not the exact correct way to say it, but for our purposes, I think that's fine. Um, so that would be a really good one to compare populations that are within the same species. But I can't assume that the tarantula they've sequenced here, completely different genus, is going to be similar to ours here in Missouri. So my plan is to actually do whole mitochondrial genome sequencing on uh, some of the tarantula samples that I have and see if I can find a region like that big one that we see in this figure. And I think it's the gene ATP8. Um, so we'll see if there's something like that. Because if I can find that, then that'll be a really good region for me to focus on. I'll get the exact DNA code and compare that between tarantulas and our different populations. So one thing we're also concerned about is tarantula welfare. Um, most folks that do genetic work with tarantulas, they're using tissues from museum specimens or they're taking tissues from live animals out in the wild. Um, tarantulas can lose legs and feet and be okay and they'll get them back on their next molt. It's a little bit like a lizard losing its tail. But uh, tarantulas in general are very sensitive to blood loss. Their blood is called hemolymph. Uh, so I'd prefer not to take tissue from them if we can help it. And since 
we're just lucky enough with our populations that we're able to know when they're molting, we can go get fresh molts. So we have been working on going through those molts, extracting DNA, and now we're working on ISSR and I'm going to start working on the mitochondrial work. Uh, we get some variab variability with the molts that we might not see if we were taking actual live tissue. Um, a molt that's been sitting out in the dirt for a year is going to give you much worse quality and yield of DNA than one where the tarantula molted yesterday and you're there to grab it. But it is important to us not to damage them. So I have some remaining questions uh, within our, our project here. So better understanding habitat loss and fragmentation and how that's affecting uh, tarantula numbers and genetic health. We need to finish that work essentially. Uh, collecting pressures. So we don't actually know how many tarantulas might be getting collected for the pet trade or for people that just found one and are like, cool, I'm going to keep a tarantula. Um, and we've only surveyed two sites. So I'm talking a lot of doom and gloom, right? That their populations are going to grow really slow. They might be really inbred, but that's only from two sites. You saw on our glade map that we have lots of glades. So a big goal of mine is to start looking at other glades and see if this low population phenomenon is maybe something that's uh, not widespread, that overall they're doing okay, we just have a few glades where there's a problem. So we need more data in Missouri to be able to know how they're doing statewide. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about a couple of those remaining questions. And one of them is collection pressure. Like how do, I keep saying, yeah, people are going out there, they're probably getting collected. Well, how do we know that? So in part, it's a guess, but the big reason we know is because we see a lot of habitat disturbance that's very specific to people that are going, looking for reptiles, amphibians, and tarantulas and scorpions. So this is a photograph from one of our sites. This is a really common thing for us to see where you see a rock and then an imprint of dirt that is the exact shape of the rock right next to it. So someone has flipped this over and not put it back. We go out of our way to put these back. Um, if we're ever moving any rocks, we're putting them right back where they were. Uh, and folks have studied this. So there's a research group in Australia specifically that has looked at moving rocks because they have a similar issues of people moving them. And if they get moved around 30 centimeters, that's a little under a foot, um, they are cooler and they're less humid on the underside. And in that Australian study, they found lower biodiversity under the rocks. So wildlife wasn't using them as well. So this is kind of a big deal that I think maybe people that are doing this don't always know that this is actually pretty destructive. Animals are not going to use that rock unless you put it back. Uh, in a lot of cases in Missouri, it's going to be illegal to be moving rocks and logs and things. So always know before you go somewhere what the local laws are. Um, folks do occasionally get ticketed for this. We have a permit to be able to go look. So that's why we're allowed to do it. And we have um, Missouri Department of Conservation staff with us quite frequently. So they know exactly what we're doing and how we do it. So even if tarantulas aren't being taken, if folks are damaging their habitat like this, they're still suffering from collection pressure. So this is kind of, um, this is where I get pretty worried because this is very preventable. Like we can stop this, this habitat degradation if we just don't flip, flip our rocks over and leave them there. So uh, habitat loss. So the picture you see here, this is a glade that hasn't had a wildfire, hasn't had a burn in a long time. So you can see that it's covered in woody shrubs. So this is a glade that's going to be not as hot as a healthy glade that doesn't have all these shrubs. If I didn't tell you this was a glade, you might not know. So this is something I'm really interested in as well, is if we get rid of these shrubs, do tarantulas come back? Are they tolerating this actually? But we knew the collared lizards don't tolerate this very well, but for some reason, could tarantulas do a little bit better? There's just some things we don't know. So glade maintenance is also very important. So the big takeaways is that, that I want you to be aware of as interested parties in tarantulas and folks from Missouri, is that the reproductive rates are actually pretty low. We can't assume that a population of tarantulas is doing fine just because they're an invertebrate. They're not like mosquitoes. They're not like mayflies. Uh, 
We need to be aware of losses of genetic diversity due to habitat fragmentation and know that these small populations like the ones at my two sites are really vulnerable. Um, the wrong cold snap or a collector coming in and taking 10 of the females, those are gonna have outsized effects on these really little populations. And then making sure that we're removing collection pressure as much as we can. And then I'll add an addendum to this, which is remember, I've only got two sites at about 50 acres each. So we can't say that what's happening at my study sites is necessarily happening across the state. Um, but it is a little concerning. It's something I definitely wanna look into a little bit more. So what can you do to help tarantulas? So talk tarantulas, tell people about them. Many people don't even know they exist in Missouri, let alone that they have these low reproductive rates and, and problems that we get a little more worried about when we talk about vertebrate animals. Um, if you're a tarantula keeper, I have nine tarantulas personally. Um, go out of your way to get captive bred animals. There's a couple ways that I do that. When I first started keeping tarantulas, I didn't know better. So I think I probably do have a couple that were wild caught, but live and learn. Um, is make sure that the, the folks you're buying from, whether that's a store or a breeder or you're at like a reptile show, make sure they know that sustainability is important to you. Um, and a lot of folks I think don't, they think spiders are spider. Their wild populations are usually gonna be fine, especially a phone of Pelma. Um, but knowing that, hey, we actually have a small case study here where they're not fine. Um, so knowing that uh, sustainability is important, you have to do population monitoring if you're gonna be collecting. Um, for me, I usually, at this point, uh, I tend to buy much, much younger animals, so slings. Um, it is possible to wild collect slings, but it's a little bit less likely, in my opinion, for you to buy a sling that's wild caught as opposed to an adult for this genus of Phonopelma. So just understanding that sustainability is important for the tarantula hobby, trying to support captive breeding, um, especially if there's like a rare wild specimen that really needs to be with zoo research or a really talented and ethical breeder, um, as opposed to being like a trophy on a shelf in a collection. Lastly, practicing leave no trace ethics when you're outdoors. So being a good habitat steward, not disturbing and destroying habitat, um, not leaving your garbage around, things like that. Also supporting efforts to restore glades in your local area if you happen to live in Missouri are also really important. So with that, I'm going to start wrapping up a little bit and talking a little bit about the people and organizations that have helped us. So thank you to the Tarantula crew. So our crew consists of folks from supporting organizations, students from University of Missouri St. Louis and a few other um, regional institute like regional universities, also the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, we just happened to bump in the Department of Natural Resources and they helped us out for a day. Also, Missouri Prairie Foundation has had folks come out. St. Louis Zoo's had some folks come out. Um, we just get lots and lots of help. And this creates really excellent opportunities for students at the University of Missouri St. Louis, who are often non-traditional students that have other jobs and things like that. We're able to help them get field experience. Um, so yeah, thank you to the Tarantula crew. And also thank you to our supporters. So University of Missouri, St. Louis, uh, the Whitney R. Harris World Center for World Ecology, um, Webster Groves Nature Studies Society. They funded a chunk of the genetics work and obviously Missouri Department of Conservation for support with our uh, permitting and help and professional advice. And they have, they have just been excellent to work with. And then last but definitely not least, Missouri Prairie Foundation. So our first season went really slow because we only had one kit of gear to process tarantulas and burrows. So it takes a really long time. Missouri Prairie Foundation helped fund travel to our study sites as well as more tarantula processing kits. So now we were able to go out with more people and cover more ground. So we were able to add that second site on this year and then even um, a little bit of a, a third that I just haven't processed the data and added in yet. So with that, there's my references, and I would be happy to answer any questions.
All right. Thank you so much, Becky. It does look like we already have some questions rolling in. So uh, one that I just had, and you probably get a lot, is um, could you touch a little bit on their diet? Yeah. So they will eat other invertebrates. Um, the one, one that I've seen that was actively eating, it had a beetle. Um, I'm sure if they get a lizard or a mouse in there, especially if it's a big adult specimen, they're going to eat them. So uh, if they can, if they can catch it and kill it, they're going to eat it. <laughs> All right. Very good. And um, just as a, uh, another question that came in is, um, can you touch on their, whether they're poisonous or not? Yeah, so uh, all spiders are venomous. Um, tarantula venom, especially in North and South America, is not particularly strong. In South America, you get very large tarantulas and some that just aren't well studied. So the venom is a little bit of a dice roll and you could get a lot of it because the spider is very big. Uh, so they are venomous, but it's not going to be like, uh, it's not going to digest your, your flesh. Most people, if they're bitten by a tarantula, report local swelling, um, muscle cramping in the limb. If you're bitten by a species with more potent venom, so say something from India, for example, those muscle spasms might be more widespread and they might last a lot longer. And folks with cardiac conditions might um, actually want to go to a doctor. But in terms of the tarantulas we have here in Missouri, unless you have an allergy like a bee sting, you're just going to be uncomfortable if one bit you. Also, no one on our project has been bitten. These, as far as tarantulas go, they're pretty docile. I do not recommend going and grabbing one. They will defend themselves. We do not just go grab them. But in terms of handling, they're very easy. We've had some individuals that we have not even restrained to put their tag on because they were just calm. And it was less stressful for them if we didn't restrain them. So hopefully that gets at that, that question a little bit. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, how did you get interested in um, tarantulas? Yeah, so I'm interested in any animals that don't get big press. So your bugs, your reptiles, your creepy crawly kinds of things. And when I came to University of Missouri St. Louis, I knew I wanted to study welfare of captive invertebrates. So like your pet tarantulas or the tarantulas at the zoo or your pet hissing cockroaches. So that's what got me into it as I've always had this interest. The reason it's interesting to me is because reading about them biologically and having psychological training, I don't see anything obvious about their nervous system that makes me think their welfare isn't important or that they can't suffer. So it's been really interesting to me to look at animals that are so different from mammals and birds and even reptiles, just other vertebrates that have very different body language and figure out how do we measure essentially emotionality in them? Like if they can suffer, if they can't, how they learn, things like that, just because they're so different from us. So to me, that's a really difficult scientific question. And it's also really fascinating. So that's what got me into them. And then I also happened to do some ecology. So that's why I'm, I'm here doing the population survey. Great. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> Karen wanted to know if they... Uh, overwinter in deeper burrows because obviously it gets pretty cold even in glade in, in the glades. I think they pick good spots that are a little less likely to freeze over or anything like that. I think they probably do go deeper, but that's actually a outstanding question is exactly where they go in the winter. I have a few burrows from big females that I know are pretty darn deep. We can't find the bottom of them. And that makes sense. Okay, maybe they go down there. But what happens to all our juveniles and our babies? So for me, that's an outstanding question. I am not sure where they go here in Missouri. Okay. And how long is your uh, project, the length of your project? So a little open-ended at this point. At some point, I have to graduate. <laughs> so, um, and then we're trying to figure out if we can visit some more sites this next year versus versus not so 
um, a little open-ended. I'm hoping to have another season, but don't don't take that to the bank yet. That's not a promise, if anyone. <laughs> Well, it sounds like it's important work, and I hope you get to do that. So another question coming in from Val is, are there differences in tarantula success between different types of glades? And so. That is an excellent question, and I, I don't know. The two sites that I have are very similar types of glades. So to go to ones that have, say, different geologic features, different types of rocks, or the overgrown versus not overgrown, I don't know. And that is a really fair and important question. It's the sort of thing that if there were other students interested in tarantula conservation, I would encourage them very much to explore those questions. Great. And then a uh, question from Devin is, um, are is there a way for, you know, just everyday folks to volunteer on your surveys? Yeah, so it it helps because our permit is so protective of the locations. It helps to be part of a supporting organization or a university student. So if you're super, super interested, um, I would recommend actually getting on a volunteer list for something like Missouri Prairie Foundation and let them know at the start, I want to help with that <laughs> tarantula thing. Or Missouri Department of Conservation, their naturalist program. Or if you're part of the University of Missouri system, absolutely reach out. Um, if the project expands or continues or other students pick up more work, I suspect there will be more opportunities. But for now, it's a little bit harder for just general public to just walk up and say, yes, I want to go help. Well, we'll definitely share how to, you know, sign up to volunteer for our organization um, with our follow-up email tomorrow. So, um, and then do you have any um, information or knowledge or comments about chert glades? Are you familiar with them? Yeah, I'm familiar with them in that they're they're a thing, but I haven't got to survey a chert glade uh, okay. as of yet. And then Jennifer asked, how do tarantulas fare in a wildfire? Yeah, so that's a big question that we have. And we did have a prescribed burn on one of our sites, so I'm still going through the data. Um, I think this is conjecture. So I am guessing right now, I still have to look at the data. I think you might see a temporary decrease in uh, populations, but that that's outweighed by the long-term benefits of having essentially good high temperatures on your glade. Additionally, I think if land managers are burning in the off season when the tarantulas are brumating, the fire is less likely to be a problem. And I think we want cool, fast fires, right? So we don't want them sitting over burrows, just smoldering. You want them to go through those fuels really quick. So long story short, I don't know, but those are those are my guesses of what would be important in terms of wildfire and tarantulas. Okay, thank you. Um, this is an interesting question from Deanna. Uh, if a you know domestic animal like a dog or a cat found a tarantula, and they tried to eat it, would, could that make them sick? Yeah, so if you had a really small cat or a small puppy that got a good dose of venom, I would watch for swelling and things just the same way you would if they caught a bee or a wasp. See if there's like evidence of an allergy. If you have a pet hamster, that's a bigger problem, but hopefully you're not out walking a hamster in a glade. <laughs> so I'm less worried about dogs and cats. Um, one defense mechanism that the tarantulas have that I just didn't really touch on is something called urticating hairs. So they have these little hairs on their, and they're on different spots and different tarantulas that can come off and get embedded in skin. They have little barbed ends uh, and they're very itchy. I've had them before and I get hives and they feel a little bit like fiberglass. But if you were to inhale those or get them in your eye, that could actually be a medical problem. So my concern would be less about pets getting bitten and getting sick, but more did they get urticating hairs in their eyes? Because that could be something that could cause health problems down the road. So in general, like if I had them in my yard, 
I have dogs, I wouldn't be too worried. Um, but if you notice an animal is swelling, itchy, and they've been around a tarantula, know that it's worth having their eyes looked at and then treating bites just like you would a wasp or a bee sting. Does this animal appear to be allergic or having some reaction? So personally, I'm not that concerned with uh, pets, but there are some things to watch for. Okay, thank you. Um, and then you had uh, spoken about the 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 life um, span of a male versus female. Can you just uh, touch on that again? Sure. The males much shorter lifespan. The females can live well into double digits. Um, I think the numbers I quoted for females were twenty plus years. And that's based on some citations in captivity, as well as what breeders report. Uh, some websites actually estimate longer. Males, it's much, much shorter. And in terms of the evolutionary reason, might be sort of a live fast, die young kind of approach um, for the males, but they're more like a seven to 10 years or possibly even a little bit shorter. When I was reading, I thought the males in particular might have been a little overestimated, but uh, yeah. So the males have a lot shorter lifespan. They're only getting that one reproductive season towards the end of their life. And the females have these really long lifespans. It also depends on the species. Some of the South American species are just, they're not gonna get near as old as the phonopelma. The phonopelmas are very long lived. Hey, thank you. Um, another question uh, is, uh, or another, it's kind of a comment of someone wondered, they wondered if the impacts of roads and fragmenting habitat are, you know, could be killing those spiders that are potentially looking for mates. Yeah. And that's something I've heard other folks express concerns about that, especially if you see articles from like Colorado or more Western states where you get these mass male migrations across roads and they actually get run over. So that's something that could be happening in Missouri. It's not something I've tried to measure. Uh, some of our genetic work might get at that. Like if there's a road separate, and there is, there's roads separating our two sites, um, that could actually be a barrier for males. So yeah, absolutely roadkill. I would be concerned about that. Um, let's see. And then do you, uh, do you know whether they, go into like a full hibernation or if they eat through the winter? Or... They're not going to be eating. Um, and in terms of physiologically full hibernation, I'm not sure because that physiology just hasn't been part of my focus. Um, but they're going to slow down. There's not really going to be much out for them to eat, even if they did have enough warmth and energy to eat. So I think they're they're definitely locked down and bedded down for the winter. And then Constance um, wanted to know if if this is just the one species that we have in the U.S., is that correct? Um, so we have a few more species in the U.S. We have more of Phonopelma. There's introduced Brachypelma, which are Central American um, genus. In Missouri, we only have a Phonopelma hensi. Um, Phonopelma is... It can be really difficult to differentiate species. That's why that study in 2016 was such a big deal. Um, so as far as we know, we've got the one species in Missouri, 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 and a few more in the south and southwest, and then some of those brachypalma. And there might be a couple other genera in there I'm missing because I'm just I'm so focused on our tarantulas. Uh, but yeah, we have more than this in the United States. All right, thank you. Um, Melanie had a question about uh, as the climate, you know, changes and and as we get warmer here, would you expect that to be a benefit to the tarantula population? Yeah, so that's an the... excellent that is an excellent question, and it's something I've been interested in, especially since we've seen that that sighting in Illinois. Like, oh, are we? Do we have a range expansion? Is this a problem at my two study sites? That's going to take care of itself. If our average temp temperatures keep getting warmer, can the tarantulas expand their range on their own and be okay? I'm not sure. And I'm not sure how long that might take. Um, 
I think the ways to get at that question would be to start figuring out um, long-term temperature changes in their preferred habitat. So actually putting some data loggers out there and seeing are there other habitats in Missouri that match those parameters and can the tarantulas actually get there? So it's possible. Uh, there, I, there's going to be a lot of other issues, but yeah, maybe the, the tarantulas could take care of themselves in light of climate change. So that's something. That's a question that uh, myself and other biologists on the project have definitely been thinking about, but we don't have a good definitive answer. Okay, thank you. Um, and and are they social at all? So they're not. The, the babies will hang out with the mom for a little bit before they disperse. They're not social in the sense that you're ever going to find two in a burrow outside of mating or outside of mother, mothers and offspring. Um, however, the way they disperse, so where we find babies, are often around areas that have one or two uh, big females nearby. So that tells me that it's possible your neighbors, if you're a female tarantula, are more likely to be your daughters or your sisters. So there's um, an evolutionary benefit of maybe being a little less likely to eat them <laughs> since they share a lot of your genetic material. So they're not truly social, uh, at least um, this species. There's some, there's some that are kept communally in activity, but it, that might be a little more artificial um, where they get lots of food so they're not eating each other. So no, they're not social in, in the way we think of like deer or dogs or cats, but uh, they do have these social aspects like mothers and offspring have that brief relationship. Like I said, it's possible with females that they're neighbors or their relatives, but we don't know that for sure. We would have to do more genetics. Okay, and another question uh, is how far, do you know how far they can travel in order to mate? Yeah, so a PhD student at uh, Mizzou 20 years ago looked at that with the telemetry studies, and I think her farthest tarantula was a little bit over a kilometer and a half. Okay, all right. So I think one last question, I think this is a good one to <laughs> wrap up with, um, can tarantulas jump? <laughs> so these ones are not gonna jump at you, the ones in Missouri. There are some in South America that like to live in trees that can do a lot more jumping and hopping. Um, but these guys in tarantula or in Missouri, these tarantulas, not so much. They're not gonna be jumping. They're not very fast. When we find them, we don't like immediately try to grab them or put a little cup over them or anything. We just let them sit there while we get all our stuff out. So they're really not very speedy or jumpy or anything like that. Okay. All right. Well, I think that concludes all the questions that we had. So thank you for taking the time to answer all of those. Um, and then, of, of course, thank you again for all this research that you're doing. Um, it sounds like a the tarantula needs a little bit more love in terms of the research. So um, I hope that you get to continue with that. Um, as mentioned before, this webinar is being recorded and an email will be sent to all of those who register tomorrow with the webinar link and other helpful resources. And if you enjoyed this presentation, we hope you'll join us for our next webinar uh, on November 22nd. And it is about Missouri's woodlands um, both the ecology and best management practices with Mike Leahy and Susan Farrington. So again, thank you so much, Becky, for your time and expertise today. And thank you all for joining us. And I hope you all have a great evening. Take care.